our first session of 2014 um, of Innovations in Education. And I don't think that our guest speaker today needs an introduction, but this is Dr. Mano Singham from Usight, and we are going to be talking about mentoring today. Take it away, Mom. Thanks, Eddie. Thanks, Eddie. Yeah, it's always nice to come over. I know so many of the people here. Uh, so when we talk about mentoring, I was actually not expecting to be in a sort of auditorium. I thought we'd be around the table and talking about it and discussing. But we can still have that. I would prefer that format than just me talking. I have some uh, slides and some comments that I will make, but feel free to stop and interject and have a discussion about that. Are going on or even after. So, so many, this has been a push recently. I mean, not just nationwide, but at our university specifically, because there has been considerable dissatisfaction uh, on uh, advising and mentoring that the students receive here. Uh, from the point of view of the undergraduates, there have been uh, efforts, there have been complaints about you know the high degree of variability of advising that students get, and there have been various initiatives to try and improve it. But the advising of undergraduates is, oops, the advising of undergraduates is, I think it's safe to say, is an unsolved problem. Uh, Jeff Wokowitz, who's the Dean of Undergraduate Studies, says that he goes to these meetings where they're discussing advising, how to improve advising, and he says it's pretty clear that you have schools that are shifting from one form of advising to trying another, the same one that other schools are shifting away from. <laughs> so it sort of just moves around these various models of advising, uh, trying to find one that seems the magic one that works, and they haven't found it yet. But we also tried, and one of the things that they uh, instituted, a concrete step was, as you know, they've uh, taken advising out of activity reports uh, from service to teaching. And the idea was that that would elevate its importance somewhat and make people more aware of the need for good advising. On the graduate student level, again, there has been considerable dissatisfaction about the variability of the mentoring that they get. It's a different, different um, issue with graduate students, and so there has been uh, if there have been efforts, and USAID has started something called the Mentor Fellows Program. Now we have about 60 faculty who have been through it. Where we talk about what it, what it takes to mentor one on one graduate students, uh, and the doc mostly doctoral, but master students as well, and what are the qualities they're going to be able to mentor. And, so on. and mentoring, then there's of course the question of mentoring faculty. And I think you, some of you know that there has been an advisory council set up to advise the provost on improving mentoring of faculty. I think Dan Billy Moria is chair of that, and they started out with mentoring of junior faculty, now they're talking of senior faculty, and also uh, the non-tenure track faculty. So there is a general sense of that we need to do something about all these, uh, the mentoring issue. So what are the things that we need to talk about? Why is mentoring important? I last, uh, was it in the fall, I went to the annual event that the Flora Stone Mentor Center has for honoring women faculty at Case. Carol was the honoree from the School of Nursing. Woohoo! And uh, I was listening to the, uh, the short speeches that each of the winners gave from me, each school. And one of the things that struck me was how often they, they reflected on their careers and the mentors that they had. They explicitly used the word mentor, the mentoring they received from various people as they moved along their career path. And what a significant role that mentoring had in their success. And it was clear they were very grateful for the mentoring they received. They cherished that experience, and it laid, helped them lay the groundwork for successful careers as professionals. And it was really striking how many of them were said. Yes? Mana, do you think that's, do you think that's particularly important to women in science? And I ask that because, you know, because we're female predominant. Is it a different, is it different, do you think, between the genders in terms of the impact of mentoring or the recognition of mentoring? When you say you're predominantly nursing, it's predominant. Right. But in the other sciences, it's right. not. It's the, it's the opposite. It's complete right. opposite. Right. Yeah. No, I think definitely people who are in uh, what I would call the minority, whatever, local milieu there, right. 
they benefit a lot more from good mentoring, but they also find it harder to get good mentoring. Okay? And the same thing happens with people who are minorities in the mentor role. They have enormous demands put on them. Uh, so for example, if you happen to be a woman or a person of color in this university, maybe not a woman in the nursing school, but any other school, uh, you will find that you, a lot of students will look to you for mentoring because you are the only person who reflects their life. If, uh, if you have a family, for example, a lot of students look to see how do you balance all that with uh, your other responsibility. Yeah. So it is difficult, more difficult for women and uh, ethnic minorities. Then we also have the issue of uh, you know, the sexuality. Uh, mentors who need, you know who are looking for role models in that area. So yeah, if you are a minority in a particular group, yes, you have challenges. You need help as a to you need mentoring, but at the same if you are in a faculty role, you will find that sometimes it's hard. You might have to actually turn down people because otherwise you just get spread too thin. You just get overworked. That's a problem. Definitely a problem. Um, so why mentoring? Well, basically this is a example of the cultural iceberg that they talk about. And above the water level is the way we say things, we get things done in an institution. These are the formal rules that are laid out in handbooks and so on. And But then below the surface is how things, the way we really get things done. <laughs> okay? And that, it's, it's not only is it not laid out, it's almost impossible to lay out how things those things, but those are really, really important. And that depends on the local dynamics, the people, the players involved, the coalition, the allies. You know, you go in, there are various politics involved locally, and uh, those things are never laid out. But those can be a minefield for people who are not aware of the dangers. And that's where the mentoring comes in. A mentor is someone who guides, makes sure you don't strike that iceberg below, that you don't know what's going on, that you don't alienate key people, you don't do the wrong, you know who the people are who should have, who can help you in this And that is where a mentor plays a really crucial role, helping people navigate that. Understanding, this is how, this is how we say we do things, but this is how it's really done. Okay? And making that. So, as a mentor, you have to be aware that is your role and helping people through that. And, you know, so I, mean, I mean, sure, many of you, some of you, but many of you, when you first came, you probably know who the people were, who you should know. And, uh, and uh, jumping ahead a bit, if you are a new person, you will take the advantage, you will take the initiative to cultivate mentors. No, you're just here for the first week, right? You're the second day here. So you, these are all, you're below the iceberg stuff, you just totally a big thing, okay? But now Lynn is helping you out. But other people get to know, who are the people who seem to know how things get done, who are successful in this area, writing grants, writing proposals, you know, who seem to be, have networked very well and so on, and find out how they do that. And take the initiative to get to know them. And you will find that you might develop a network of mentors that will help you through and sometimes the mentors may not know that they're a mentor, that they're a mentor to you. Okay? Um, we'll, but, so there's something that they call tacit knowledge related to the iceberg. It's really similar to that. Approximately 70% of what someone needs to know to function effectively is learned outside of formal training. And tacit knowledge about how things really get done is extremely difficult to capture, qualify, and deliver. Okay? And that's what the mentors do. They, they, they are able to communicate on an as-needed basis, rather than uh, these formal rules tend to be upfront. You you probably get the handbook and say, look at this and these are the rules and this is the things for that. But the, uh, uh, these tacit knowledge is more valuable when it's done on an as-needed basis when you need. Okay? So that's what mentors do. So what is mentoring? I just I mean it's hard to define. We will take a shot at it. This is something from a book by Johnson on mentoring. Uh, and I'll let you read it. Okay. 
So that's sort of nice to capture on the thing. So, but we can break it down, and I think Irina, in the notice that you sent out, you took this from that uh, website, uh, you said website where I put it, and this <coughs> breaks it down into the different elements that go into mentoring. You are an advisor, and we know, we have a better idea of what an advisor is in terms of its formal role, but mentors are more than advisors. They do many more things, and it actually can be quite overwhelming to think that you're doing all this. But as I said, much of this is done on an as-needed basis. And it's, uh, so it, although it looks overwhelming, it, when you actually do it on a conscious basis, you may not find it that overwhelming. And as I said, it may turn out to be sort of informal. I, I always think that when I look at this, a mentor is such a honorable thing to be. But I don't think it's something that we, it's a label we don't need. It's not a label we give to ourselves. It's like being, nobody calls themselves a philanthropist or a humanitarian, okay? That's something other people confer on you. So, when, you know, I doubt when Carol spoke about her mentors, I doubt that they thought of themselves as a mentor. She conferred an honor on them by saying, these people were my mentors. It is a positive thing. So in some sense, being a bad mentor is kind of an oxymoron. <laughs> there should not be such a thing as a bad mentor, unless it's something that's an assigned role. You know, you, you have you, know, said, okay, you are going to be the mentor for so and so, and you could be a bad mentor. But that's not really a mentor. You have just been—it's just a label that's been attached to you. But a real mentor is something that the mentee. And there's not a really good word for the person who is mentored. Some people say mentee. Some people say protege. The mentee is the one who assigns, gives you that honor, saying you were my mentor. And it, it is really great honor. People who have had good mentors, if you feel a sense of honor. I recall once I was uh, the dean of the Arts and College of Arts and Sciences he invited me for a lunch for mentors or faculty, and I said, I'm not a mentor for anybody. I think so. I called the office and I said, I think you made a mistake on something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not a mentor for anybody. So the secretary said, No, no, you're a mentor. You're a mentor. You're a mentor. You invited me for lunch. So I said, uh, Who am I supposed to be mentoring? Uh, so she said, well, there's this, uh, this faculty member in another department, no less. So I said, really? So next time I met that faculty member, I, I said, you know, I, I was on this list of mentors, and they said, you are the one who said I was mentor. And she said, yeah. I mean, I'm in your office all the time. I'm asking about teaching. I'm asking about this and that. And so, and so I considered you my mentor for teaching on all on, on matters issues to teach. So I said, I was quite honored, actually. I felt flattered that she considered me that. But it was a title she conferred on me. It was not something that I was assigned or anything. And I think that's, ideally, that's the best way. Mentorships are things that grow organically out of relationships. You, you may need to have formal mentoring policies in institutions. And sometimes you can't avoid it, because otherwise some people may not get mentored at all, people who, for whatever reason. But ideally, it's something that grows like this. Any about those issues of mentoring? Yeah. I'm sort of, I mean, I'm thinking sort of on two levels. One is that what are we with our students? And mm -hmm. I wonder if sometimes if our terminology drives our performance, right? Because we call ourselves advisors. Right. Right? So, and that's your, how many advisees do you have, right? So are we sort of setting ourselves up in some respects by using that term? Because then it sort of, it almost sort of suggests what the role should be. Yes. Right? Versus, you mean by calling ourselves advisors? Right, right. And, but I don't know that for every student we're mentors either, right? If that's conferred. So it's, it seems to me it's a combination of some of these things. So it's advisors and sponsors, for example. Right. Right. So, and then thinking about sort of faculty colleagues coming along, um, because we, I was sort of grinning at it and because we assign we make sure everybody has a mentor, and if we don't, then we make recommendations. So my, my contribution was to say we can't assign a mentor that is counter to how the process should work. What we're assigning is really a sponsor. Right. Right? So, and I think that's where, if our terminology is correct, we're really sort of helping people find a sponsor. If it develops well, it may become a mentoring relationship, but at least it's a sponsor to start. So, I don't well, know, I like that idea, because it's, it is awkward. It is awkward, right? Right. And I, I'm not certain that I do all these roles in my assignment as a mentor. 
nor do in my the mentors who have been assigned to me do I actually expect all this effort. Sometimes I just want a sponsor or yeah. or a supporter or a, right or a tutor, right? So it's or different. a model. I want right. to go. How did you do that? Right. Well, that's right. It's it's an and once I have the information, I may not even return to that person. I might just you know, <coughs> I just need a one time. But it's I think, really interesting. Let's go for it. <laughs> I think the, the idea is, yes, we, we know what advising is. And that's usually the starting point for with our relationship. We are science students and we are advising. So how does it become a mentor relationship? I think we have to be aware that the advisee is usually looking for more than just the advising role. But they may not know what they're looking for. Okay. So the question is, how do you develop a feeling in the advisee that you are open to more than just the advising group. Now, one of the complaints we have with uh, students, students when it comes to advising, is that the advisor just sees their role as releasing their holes. <laughs> and that was so electronic. Yeah. <laughs> you don't even have to see them anymore. Right. right. And in fact, the registrar has got a request to see can I just have a blanket hold release, not even student by student, so that I can check one box and every student's uh, holes get released. So that just shows how much value is being placed on this whole thing. So, but the advisory, is, uh, so they have, that's a minimal requirement. Now, if, they, if you go to the advisor and that's the advisor doesn't even bother to meet you, I just said, you know, give me the form or, or, or just tell me what, so then I'll just sign up electronically. Then this, the subliminal message given to the student is, this is all that person wants to have to do with me. That person wants to have the absolute minimum interaction with me. Okay? So, but if you, on the other hand, take the time and say, no, I'd like to talk to you. I mean, tell you, what are you interested in? You know, what are your career goals? What are, are there any issues that you have? If you go beyond the minimum and show the student that you have interest in that person as a person, and that you need to talk, Okay. Then you are opening the stu to the student the possibility that you are a person who could be a mentor. They may not. Students don't use the word mentors. Okay. It's not in that part of their vocabulary. It's something that's older people. <laughs> it's an older person word. But they do need mentors, and they are looking for it. But they won't, won't call you that. Okay. Uh, so, uh, but the question: is How do you? What? How do you project your? Uh, relationship with the students, so that when, what do they see when they interact with you? Do they see some? It, it was very interesting when I had a, in my class, I asked students, what are you looking for in a teacher? Uh, when you, what are you looking for in a good teacher? And one of the things they said was, we want someone who sees us as more than just a brain, but sees us as a whole person. They want, you know, someone who's interested in their luggage. They have lives. They have actually quite interesting lives. And they want to, you know, you, you to feel that that's of value. So the question is, if the transition from, it may start out as advising, but whether it grows beyond, that is something that I think you have to give the cues, the appropriate cues for your freedom entry. If you, you can consciously turn it off, because you may not, it may be overwhelming. But you know, you can give the cues that say, I am open to being a mentor. So what are the differences between advising and mentoring? So, if you just take a look at that. So the left hand side is pretty clear, right? It's, it's pretty clear. Right? The right hand side is more fuzzy. But that, that's the where the mentoring comes in. By finding opportunities to you know share your sharing your own career path with them. That's something that I mean students very often don't quite realize that our paths were not some smooth sailing all the way. You know, we had challenges, we had setbacks. To overcome difficulties and so on. And I'm not saying that you should be sort of 
revealing your whole life history to students. But if you sense that a student is having some sort of difficulty, that you, uh, you can uh, share it with them. You know, you know this is not uncommon. This I had a similar experience like this, and this is how we dealt with it. So all the kind of uh, things like sharing, uh, uh, giving them encouragement, and sharing articles, making them aware of opportunities that are out there, and so on. These are the things that make them realize that there's more to life than just the class, class work and so on. And this last one provides insight into demystifying graduate school by sharing how things work within the department with, this is when you're mentoring graduate students, uh, and even a junior faculty. Uh, it's, it's, it's a bit of a tricky thing because there's, it's a political issue. You don't want to I mean, you as a senior faculty member would be aware of all the politics and where and so on, but you, you don't want to, there's a you know, professional collegiality too. I had a faculty member who had a problem because a student came to that person and said, you know, they were thinking of working on a research project and they were thinking of working with Professor X. Now this faculty member knew that Professor X was not a good person to work with. So in the sense that that person was, could be abusive, could be exploitative, and uh, not reliable. So how do you deal with it? You know, not having to X is your colleague. But at the same time, the student doesn't, isn't aware of what she might be letting herself in for if she was. So you have to be very careful about how you handle things like that. I think ultimately your responsibility is for the well-being of the student. So you have to find some way of communicating that information in a way without necessarily dragging Professor X's name into the mud. <laughs> uh, but those, those are the kinds of tricky issues that mentors face, helping students to navigate these kinds of things. I just think it's very interesting and kind of for the undergraduates moving from the advising to mentoring. I think sometimes the students don't really know what they want. Yes. And, um, Not some bad <laughs> No, really. I mean, that's a problem. It's developmental. It's a developmental thing. So you listen to them. So they kind of think that they come to me so that I can lift the holes and like help them get through the, the network. And then if I say, well, you know, maybe you should work on that, and you know, then I'll try to tell them that this is going to help you if you learn how to work through the system or whatever. Then I kind of get the sense that. They think they didn't get a good advisor because I didn't wave my magic wand, you know. So, I don't know. You mean their expectations are low? Yeah. Well, their <coughs> expectations, they don't know that sometimes that what I have to offer them in terms of, you know, talking about their career as a nurse or those sort of things, they really just want me to sign the paper. And But then on the other hand, I do think that they appreciate when you just take notice of them. Yeah, one of the things is, I always say, when, when, whenever you have an any encounter with a student, you are not, even if it's the first time, you are not a new person to them. You are the sum total of all the teachers they've had before. All right? Their That's expectation of you, their expectation of you is based on entirely that history. And you may have nothing, you may have nothing to do with it. So if their expectation before has been of teachers of a certain kind, people who just do this and so on, that's what they expect. And if you go beyond that, they are initially, they are at a loss too. Okay. They, are, they are not sure why you are talking to them about these things. They just say, so you, you have to be aware that there might be some resistance to this. So, but at the same time, so what I'm saying is if a student comes to you and they just want you to release the whole, but I would, I wouldn't recommend you having a two hour conversation <laughs> because that's too far removed. But have at least some conversation, 15 minutes, talk about their career plans and so on, and say that this is important and so on. And they may be a bit puzzled as to why you are doing this, or what purpose it is. But it is something they will appreciate. And what you're doing is you're changing their expectation of the norm. So then as they go on, they think, okay, there are there's a different way that some people do this. Yeah. But I always say, that's why whenever you try anything new in teaching or mentoring or something, be aware that there will be resistance. Because people are comfortable with what they had before. And 
if they, they, they can do the same thing over and over again, and that's fine. But so if you try to do something new, there will be resistance, and you have to work a little bit. Yeah. 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 So they they may not appreciate it at the beginning, but they will. I need to change it. Quickly. And that's how and that's how cultures change. If, if if more people do that, word gets around among the students that this is the norm. Okay, and that's what it is. Because uh, they they students sometimes have a sort of a somewhat narrow view of what careers are like, especially in professional schools. They think engineers, they think they're going to be bench engineers, they think nurses, they're going to be... But they don't realize that the actual professional world is a very complex world. It requires a vast set of skills, how to deal with people, administration, you know, keeping records. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that goes into becoming a successful professional, quite apart from just the technical knowledge that you have. I mean, one of the things that they find with engineers is engineers, engineering students tend to think that technical knowledge is really important. Being able to work with others or being able to write and so on are not that important. And you, disabusing them of that belief is really important because otherwise they just want to just drown. Because, you know, when you start, the first few years, yeah, you're a technical person. But after that, you start rising in the management, you know how to deal with people, you have to write reports, you have to do presentations. You have to be able to, you know, do a lot of things that you never were trained for. So if your if your uh, mentors at the early stages didn't make you aware that this is what engineering is like, you are not really prepared for the world. But they may not realize it at that time. They may think, you know, okay, all I want to know is get into engineering 145. Once if I get into that, I'm set. No, you're not. not. That's not what uh, you need. To. So yeah, it, it, it's changing their attitude too. But, but remember, I think it is true that they they may not appreciate it and that uh, immediate thing, but they are, one of the things that students always say is that when they come to college, they are looking for a personal relationship with faculty members. Okay? We had this, uh, we had a big discussion with the whole group of students about advising. And so they were complaining about the fact and, you know, that advisors were not interested in that course uh, in their careers, they just wanted to release the holes, they didn't talk to them about it. So we said, okay, what about the possibility of doing away with faculty advisors and having professional administrative advisors, like the Weatherhead School has. You know, the Weatherhead School doesn't have faculty advisors. They have a group of their faculty people. They have faculty, but they're not advisors. There are three or four people who have been hired purely to advise students about their So we said, would you like that? You probably get people who really know what courses you should take, who really can check off all the correct boxes so you won't make any mistake in courses. And they said, no. Despite complaining about the faculty advisors, they wanted to retain the faculty advisors because that at least had the promise of developing into a good relationship. Even if in the reality, it didn't always occur that way. But it had the promise of having a relationship with a faculty member on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So they really look for that, okay? And that's, that's, you could be that person. So it's very interesting, they really want that. So if you develop relationship with these students, that is probably their most formative experience. And if I'm not, I mean, just like Carol mentioned a mentor, when I think back on my life, I remember certain people who played crucial roles, who, whom I felt um, helped me at crucial times. And not in an academic way, this is on a personal level. When we have a difficulty or something. Those are the people we remember. And these are the people, these are the what we call mentors. So I, I want to tell a story, but I was looking around and it's not really going to affect anybody in the room. So, um, so feel free to pass it out. It's not meant to be just exclusive to this room. So I teach a course in pharmacology to our MSN students. And it's an on site course. It's all past an on site course in the past. This year I'm also teaching it online. And my caveat for enrolling online is that the student who wants to enroll in the online course has to ask for permission. And when the SIS permission notice comes on board, I go, Thank you for your interest. Tell me these three things. What's your specialty? Who's your advisor? And have you talked over this? 
decision to enroll in an online course with your advisor. See, I'm a real control for you, as you haven't guessed. So I just kept a few statistics, a few, and I'm trying to recall the exact numbers, but of the people who requested permission, four had enrolled in the incorrect course. They wanted on-site uh, online. Oh, I enrolled in the online? I'll have to go back. I'm like, fine, permission denied, move on. So, and if I granted permission, you know, they would have, uh, what a mess. Yeah. Three students asked, why do I have to talk to my advisor about this? And my concern has to do with the success, their success in this course, that sometimes people don't understand the amount of time and energy involved in an online course. And my data are actually based on a colleague, uh, Carol Kelly's data, that would suggest that up to 50% of students who enroll in an online course never look at recorded lectures. Never. 50% never look at course <laughs> content that's been designed by the faculty to contribute necessary, essential, key content. And her lectures are 20 minutes. Mine, by the way, are three and a half hours and I don't take a breath. <laughs> yeah, you don't get a break. You can't go to bed. No, I'm going to say it. It's like, hit that pause button. Yeah, really. So I'm just saying, I mean, she makes it very convenient, and, and but 50% of her online students never access that content. And so I, and you cannot be successful in pharmacology without accessing the content that I deliver. I'm really certain about this because there are nuances in prescribing uh, drugs in the, as, as an MP that just can't be conveyed by reading a textbook or looking at a couple of YouTube videos or, you know, recalling what you did as an RN. It just, anybody here prescribe? So when you put your pen to the paper, it's kind of scary, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Even if you're doing something that you do all the time, electrolyte replacement or something that you, you do out every day, you're like, did I really write 10 or did I write 20? Oh my God, what did I write? And it doesn't matter if you have screens that cue you. There's a real, so to try and convey that responsibility is really nuanced. Right. Which comes, through real clearly, didn't you just get it now? Like, none of you want to prescribe after hearing that, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But you, you, you know, hearing all the factors that go in there and how they change up over the course of the semester where I'm trying to build on this content. So I'm sorry this is such a long story, but of the three people who said I'd have to talk to my advisor, I said, yeah. So I don't like check with the advisor. I just wait until they email back and say, yeah, I talked to Liz Madigan or whoever their advisor is, and she approved it. Um, and then the other people were real clear and upfront. I'm a distant student. I live in California. Yeah, I had that conversation. I'm like, yeah, no, no problem. <laughs> but, I get that, so. but you know, if there are. But I just thought three out of, out of maybe 25 requests that was sort of sad to me that they didn't want to have that conversation with their advisor. We can often give them good advice about blending work-life balance, doing these other kinds of advising with some components of measuring. Sure. It's a lost opportunity for the student. But it's probably because they have never had a sort of valuable conversation. With the I mean, they, as I said, they're going by their past experience. And if the past experience has been kind of uh, perfunctory, uh, I think what's the point, you know? Uh, if people are just going through the motion. So that's really uh, come to the question of do, do the students feel you're going through the motions? And if if you are not, and if you take an interest in them over time, they will become more climatized and become appreciative of that and realize the value of it. Because as you, and just now you're talking about prescribing, I mean, it's being a nurse is such a responsibility. I mean, it's a huge responsibility. And, I, and conveying the gravitas of that, the, the, the thing that they have, is not something that you can just teach. It's something right. that, you know, you can talk in terms of personal experience, you know, things that have happened, or stories that you know. Those stories and 
information that come outside, those are the things that convey the, the professional ethos that you're trying to develop. In. So. And then, you know, I just, it, it appears to me that it would be good all of us to address expectations on both sides, mentor and mentee. And I don't know if that, that should be done in a group, at orientation, or individually. I mean, I think you need an, in, you need an institutional culture that values it and creates opportunities for it. How do you get to this thing? Well, I think if you have many opportunities where students and faculty interact socially and informally, then you are creating greater opportunities for these spontaneous mentoring relationships to occur. People encounter people in these things. Uh, in general clubs and so on, where on uh, functions that the, uh, the department has or the school has, they will find like-minded people who they will gravitate towards who they can do that. So yeah, that's I think an important way of creating these things. Having, as I said, having formal assignments is important because that can provide the basis for something to go into a mentorship, a formal advising relationship. But the people who are assigned that formal mentoring relationship have to be aware of the fact that they have to create the opening for the relationship to go further. While at the same time, I mean, and you could, sometimes you're going on the other side. Sometimes there are students who will want to be more than just yeah. cross boundaries that you don't want to go. So you have to, it's a delicate thing. I mean, being a mentor is a tricky business. Being an advisor is much easier. But being a mentor is really important, but at the same time, much tricky. Yeah. So, um, what? I know they want to uh, do it. And I, I once, I just sat down and tried to look at the dif differences between classroom teaching, the relationship that occurs in a classroom teaching environment and the mentoring of graduate students. I thought that we think of mentoring as an extension of teaching, but actually, in terms of actual operational aspects of it, they're very different. Mm -hmm. And I found that they're really quite this thing. I mean, I can send the slides to people too. What? You want to publish this? Though, sure. What? You want to publish this? I'm too old to worry. Shh! These are going to see it. We can prove it. Yeah, I should uh, uh, regulate it. Yeah. But, so, what are the personal qualities of good mentors? Okay, yeah, that's important. Because, you know, to be a good mentor, you must, have, uh, you must be aware of what you should be doing. And here are some other things. The fourth bullet point, emotional intelligence, I mean, that's a buzzword, but actually it does make sense. Being aware that, you know, of the need, being sensitive to the needs of the mentee and not going beyond what that person needs. Because that person also has boundaries that you have to respect, and right? You have to be aware of what that person seems to be looking for and be willing to be provided. And the fifth bullet point is positive effect and personal warmth, of course. That, those are the uh, uh, signals that people look for to say that, you know, I could have a relationship with this person. Though, you know, 
I, I remember in graduate school, uh, there was a professor who was very good, but and he taught me then, but whenever you asked him a question in class, he would really snap at you, really put you down, and be very dismissive and condescending. So I asked a question and he put me down and asked another question and I thought, what's going on here? I can't ask a question. So I stopped asking questions in class. And uh, then, but you know, I, it was quantum mechanics. I had to understand this stuff. So I went, I thought, okay, I'm not going to ask in class because I'm humiliated in front of my friends. So I went to his office and tentatively knocked on the door and put us a, I need to ask a question. And then he took me into his office and sat me down and talked for an hour. And after, <laughs> after I'd answered my question, he told me the stories about the great physicists and stuff. And what the hell is this? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then, so I, and it, it was so bad, I couldn't get away. <laughs> I, I couldn't get away. And I found that this was happened all the time. So I had to actually plan my question. I, so I said, okay, no more. I planned my visit to his office 15 minutes before my next class. <laughs> so that I get to go ahead and say, oh, because I have, to, I have a class now. I honestly say I have a class. I have he said, okay, you have to go. Because otherwise he wouldn't let you go. So then I realized that he had actually a very positive effect on warmth, but for some reason, it didn't manifest itself in the classroom. If you went by his classroom personality, he was the most cold, distant, unlikable person. But on a one-on-one -on -one basis, and later on, I spoke to my, he was not my thesis advisor, I spoke to my thesis advisor, I said, what's going on here? And he told me that this professor, although he's very good, he's also very insecure. And when people ask questions in class, it puts him on edge. Although he's very good, he just has that insecurity and he doesn't want questions in class because he feels somehow he left over. So he said, so I stumbled upon this strategy of asking outside the class. But so this, my advisor was doing the mentoring role. He was explaining to me the politics of what, well, what's going on here, why it's not, why he's like this, and giving me a greater understanding of what the personality of the person was. But you know, so positive effect and want may not always be immediately visible with people. But if you provide enough opportunities to interact with people, students can pick that up. Okay. Uh, any other, what those other qualities? I'm just noticing that there are a lot of the things that pretty much, like um, we were talking, my students go into Cleveland schools and they work with the younger right. children. And they realize that the children look up to them when they demonstrate these characteristics. You know, first they just want something warm, affirms that they exist, mm -hmm. you know. And that it's the same sort of relationship. Yes. You know, they say, well, how do you go to college? You know, um, it's cute. You know, they ask those sort of questions, but it's very hard to explain to students. So I'm like, why, why do we volunteer in Cleveland School of Law? And not everybody gets it, but, but you know, they have that opportunity to be in this very mature role that they're going to, you know, <coughs> their students carry that on, that they learned how to be that for a youngster. Because <laughs> these are all the things I want my students to do when they're with the children, you know. Don't be defensive if they say, do you take drugs? <laughs> <laughs> the children are so honest. Yes. yes. And they just, you know, they go right for it. Um, and I think what a maturing effect it has on our, you know, sophomores are just, whatever, 19 years old. And all of a sudden, I see this light goes off that it's time for them to be the adult in the relationship. And, you know, someone's looking up to them. Uh, it's the same sort of thing. They are being a mentor, or not being a mentor, but a role model. Yes, they're being a role model. But, you know, it's all those roles sort of blend into each other. The mentoring requires a more long term uh, in the relationship. But, yeah, the role model, being a role model is an important component of being a mentor. That full umbrella of uh, quality. Yes, and having them realize that there are other people who are looking, who look up to them as role models can be very inspiring for them. And you, as a mentor, making students aware that this is their role is really opening them up to what being professional is. That, that, so you're playing, playing the role of the mentor, 
teaching them that they are role models for others. Yeah. It's a wonderful feeling. I mean, to me, I think they're going to take this with them the rest of their life. Like this was such a good, and, and it's hard to produce that kind of relationship. And it's like we have the perfect opportunities, but it's very hard to put in the words. Yeah. Um, I think this is just listing, listing some of the more distinctive components of entry. The social and emotional support is really fun. Sometimes, you know, universities can be lonely places for some students. Identifying those students who are, seem to be not getting integrated into the among the peers of the, and I helping them is important. Come here, mentor service limited role models coming back to what uh, you just mentioned. Uh, mentoring results in identity transformations. You really you can have a profound <coughs> effect on people who you mentor. And that is something to be aware of. How do you know that? How do you say that um, you have a profound effect? How? Yeah. How do you Look at the, I mean, and you can just see when people reflect on them, like what Carol and all the other people spoke about. They, they, when they spoke about the mentors, it was clear that those people had really a transformative effect on their lives. Now, as I said, sometimes it may not be obvious to you at the moment. This is, as I said, mentoring is really a retrospective judgment one confers on someone. And you may not realize, I mean, I know that my graduate mentor had a transformative effect on my life. There's no, I, but I may not have, I don't think I realized it at that time. But looking back, I see so many of my values there. There's a nice book about uh, uh, mentor. They, they followed the trajectories of three well-known mentors and they followed their students. These are all, all the ways in the 70s and 80s the students and their students and the students and they saw how the patterns of mentoring of these people went down from generation to generation and it's like those students had modeled their behavior on these people and one of the things they said was that the mentors rarely spoke explicitly about what they were doing as mentors they just were role models and the way they behaved and they interacted with the students these students just absorbed it without having been being explicitly instructed in this is how you should behave as a physicist or a biologist or a clinician or something. The, it, they just picked it up from the way their mentors interacted with them. Um, I believe it. I just was kind of asking you because I'm always wondering how I can um, explain that to the students, you know, what effect it's having. Um, you know. The education data, I think that, um, I don't know what the quote was that, you know, doing a reflective exercise sometimes brings that to the forefront, right? right? If you, rather, that, so that they, doing that self internal reflection helps you put it on a piece of paper. Now, not, not that people don't always have that ability, and sometimes the transformation doesn't show up until after, it's a long time afterwards. So early in my teaching career, um, Mano and his team came and videotaped me teaching, and there I was being defensive in the classroom. <laughs> People were interrupting my lecture with questions. <laughs> and I didn't know the answer to some of those questions. <laughs> so I was freaking out, and um, Mano very gently said, you know, you could just say, I'm a little, I, I don't know. I mean, nobody's going to like, you know, on that. I'm like, really? <laughs> so I don't know exactly what you said, but now I'm very comfortable in the classroom going, I have no idea. Does anybody else know the answer? <laughs> oh my gosh, how are we going to discover the answer? You know? And, and keep <laughs> <laughs> They're like, just Google it. Right? They're all holding up their little tablets telling me what the answer is. Thank you very much. <laughs> but anyhow, it's it's fun to kind of color it right. all. And it's also 
interesting to say, you know what, I'm listening to myself getting really anxious because I'm not on course with, you know, and so I want you to know my tone of voice is more about my own anxiety, not about what you're asking. So just owning it, people are like, oh, we don't care if you finish that. I'm like, oh, great, then I'm here. <laughs> You'd be surprised at how many faculty members I know. I, I, my faculty member, I think, the professor, he's in a, he's in a, he retired now, he's here for 40 years. He said, before every lecture, he would go to the bathroom and talk. Yeah. <laughs> the point being is, if you'd ask me to reflect during that time of videotaping and watching that videotape, I would have said, this is the most painful, right. embarrassing, and traumatic Oh, it's ever. terrible. I didn't do it myself <laughs> soon after I came here. It was just. Oh my God! It's nasty. It's but it really opens your eyes. And, I and then, if you ask me to reflect after I incorporated some of the changes, I mean, the reflections would have changed over time. And, um, so, you know, that's the point. Is but the try a reflective exercise. Maybe you only got twenty-five percent deep, and you know, interesting reflections. The other seventy-five percent of the people are like. Check that off. Yeah. So I think mean, uh, so about yeah. But you know, I, I, no. as a seminary is tricky. Yeah. Like, I think this is from a person who I really thoughtful comment from a mentor. I think she's absolutely right. And that might be the reflection that you're asking for is a relationship. What relationship? It might be with a peer, with a colleague, a student, or with a teacher, or with a, with other young students, or it might be with a bus driver that drives in that door. That is the work. What work? Yes, That occurred during that clinical rotation that might, you know, affect how you do the rotations. Because it's more relationship. Yeah. I think it's a good relationship. I think they're going to storm the basket. Yeah, they are. <laughs> All right. I'm like waiting for the battery. <laughs> <laughs>